everybody. We're going to go, go ahead and get started with our time of singing this morning. There may be fewer of you in here, but y'all are doing a lot of talking, which is great. You can't hear me, Mr. Dan? You, oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started singing this morning. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise. Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou in Success, spirit of holiness, on us descend. Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep air. Jesus, I said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. Loving my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. What a beautiful day it is this morning. The sun is shining, and we are here, and we're smiling, and we're excited, and we're going to fellowship and worship together. This morning, Dan will we'll start our new series on true worship and what that looks like and what that means. So I hope you are excited about that as we continue this, this series through the end of March in through April. Um, a couple of announcements I want to bring your attention to our bulletin. A lot of time is put into this, so be sure that you are reading that and being up to date on the upcoming events. And it's always funny to me when we publish it and then we announce it and then somebody says, I didn't know that was happening. <laughs> well, guess whose fault that is? So make sure you're reading this and you're going through it and you're understanding what's going on. Uh, a couple of highlights out of our bulletin this morning. Uh, we have two new members that we can rejoice over and, and keep in our prayers. Melanie Wilkins was baptized Thursday the 7th. Um, be sure to give her some support and prayers and lift this young lady up. And then also Melissa Kirby, uh, Sybil Penn's daughter, has placed membership uh, with us here at the Broadway family. So uh, be sure to encourage them um, to keep them in your prayers as they go um, into this world and Satan hates the fact that they've done these things. So they, he will try harder and harder to discourage them. Therefore, we need to try harder and harder to encourage them. Um, and today at 3.30, um, we have uh, Becky Park. It will be giving us a seminar on this plan to protect, this seminar preventing abuse to these people who are vulnerable. Uh, that's today at 3.30 here in the Fellowship Hall if you can make yourself available to that, that will be full of good information um, regarding that. Also, gentlemen, listen up. If you are a man, listen. Do I have your attention? My wife has to tell me three or four times before she starts talking. So listen up. March 23rd. That is March 23rd. Where's Tommy at? He was here. I saw him. He's up top. Tommy, what day is it? 
March 23rd, right, at 10 o'clock, at the Love Shack Farms, we'll be doing a um, firearms and fellowship and fish fry. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. Why would we miss out on that opportunity? Some of the three greatest things that the good Lord has blessed us with, we get to combine in one day, shoot things, eat things, and fellowship with our brothers and sisters. So, uh, our brothers or sisters, you're not invited, sorry. <clears throat> Um, that is March 23rd at 10 o'clock out at the Love Shack Farms. Um, be sure that you let the office know if you're planning on attending that. And that, Tommy, what day? 23rd of March. Be sure to be there. Let's worship and praise together and let's encourage one another. All right, this is one of our newer songs. We're going to sing it as we head into a time of prayer this morning. Hide me now under your wings. Cover me within your mighty hand. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know his power in quiet and trust when the oceans rise and thunders roar I will soar with you above the storm Father you are king over the flood I will be still and know you are God when the and rise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know Pray with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for all the many blessings of this life, especially the spiritual blessings where you gave your son to die on the cross so we'd have the remission of our sin. Father, I ask you to be the congregation here at Broadway. Help them to grow and help us to grow and prosper as we should and according to your will. Pray that you'll be with the elders. They lead us in the right direction so we can do that. Father, we pray that you'll be with the leaders of the world over. Help them to work out an agreement where we can live in peace and continue to worship you without being bothered in any way. As they go, the ones that are sick, heal them if be their will, and help them to get back to their much wanted health. As they be the ones that's lost loved one here lately, and pray that you'll comfort them as only you know how. Go with us now as we go through this service, Father, and we pray that you will always uh, help us to worship you in the truth and spirit as we're instructed in your word. Pray that you go with us now, forgive us of our sin, and Father, when this life is over, pray that you'll give us a home with you in heaven. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 
Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read selected passages from Matthew, beginning in, verse, in chapter 27. <clears throat> I'll be skipping around a little bit to kind of summarize Christ's crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Beginning in uh, verse 22, Christ is before Pilate, and Pilate says, What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. Then the soldiers took him, stripped him, mocked him, beat him. It says, After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes. When they led him away, then they led him away to crucify him. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Then from noon, it got dark. Verse 45 says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said he's calling Elijah. <clears throat> says, he cried at verse 50. Well, then when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. <clears throat> when the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. I find that interesting, that a man that was not a follower, seeing the very things that happened, made this great proclamation. Surely he was the Son of God. After the Sabbath, at the dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of them that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, but I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. As we partake of the bread, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the plan of salvation. 
Father, that you were willing to take the suffering, the death um, of Jesus Christ in my place. Dear Lord, we thank you for this bread which represents to us his body offered there upon the cross. Help us to take of it in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the precious blood of Jesus, which washes us white as snow. Please forgive our sinful thoughts and deeds and our shortcomings. Father, help us to partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents to us Christ's blood, in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its words. It sounds like music in mine ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. Because he first loved me. <clears throat> what is one thing we do for those that we love? We give them gifts. We love them. We give them gifts to show our admiration and our love for them. We have an opportunity at this time to give a gift back to God. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul's instructing the, the uh, Corinthians there. He says, now about the collection for God's people... Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. We're, we want to offer our thanks to God for all the rich blessings that he has given us. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the measure of health that we have. We thank you for this opportunity to, to be here Dear Father, we thank you for our ways and means of income. Dear Lord, help us to give back to you as we have purposed in our heart and to do so cheerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to sing, sing, sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing, I'm going to shout. Praise the Lord. When those gates are open wide, I'm going to say that Jesus' son. I'm going to sing, I'm going to shout. Praise the Lord. I'm gonna sing, sing, sing. I'm gonna shout, shout, shout. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord. When those gates are open wide, I'm gonna sit at Jesus' side. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord. Now, before we dismiss our kids to children's worship, I want to let everyone know that it's that time again that we're starting to think about preschool registration. I know some of you are going, what? It's already... Yes, it is. It's already about that time to start thinking of those sort of things. And it is our best advertising force when you guys encourage parents that you know that have children who are looking for a preschool to attend, encourage them to check into our Precious Pottery program. I know Donna Hadfield and the other teachers do a great job. Personally, my children have gone there. You can talk to Jason. Jason's kids have gone there. It's a great program. And time and time again, most of the people that come and sign up have come in contact with one of you. So if you would help us out, there's information in your bulletin. There's also some uh, flyers on the connections desk. So if you'd pick those up and just share that information with any families that you may know looking for a preschool home in the coming year. But now it's time. If you've got any children ages two through six, they can head back to children's worship where they'll have a time of worship designed especially for them. 
And while they're all getting situated, we're going to sing one more song before our scripture reading and lesson this morning. Let's stand as we sing together. Light of the world, you stamp down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. King of all days, all so highly exalted. Glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. All for our sake became poor. And here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And here I am to worship here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, all so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Be seated, please. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading will be from Genesis chapter 21, verse 31 through 34. So that place was called Beersheba, because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of the forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the Eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. <clears throat> Amen. I remember not too long ago, that boy was a little kid running around, and everybody was patting him on the head, and now he's pulling people's teeth and doing all kinds of stuff to people. We're so happy you're here this morning. <clears throat> Our hearts go out to all of you, and especially to those in the family of the Eisenbergs who have lost Brother Charles, and to Scott, who's lost his father. It's a difficult thing to lose a father. Makes life different for you after that. And it's a difficult thing to lose a husband. Many of you know. Keep these families in your prayers. All of you who are guests with us, visitors with us, we've got a little blue sheet inside your bulletin. Take that out. It has a little guide, one for the kids on the back, one for you on the front where it says true worship. Follow us along in the lesson. Fill in the blanks. You know, I've thought and prayed about this lesson a long time. We're beginning a series today about worship, and I realize that true worship really only comes from true worshipers. So I want you to think today and ask you this question, are you a true worshiper? 
when I think about what worship really is in Scripture, worship, in my view, is a personal, spiritual intimacy with God. It's when I personally become intimate with God and connect with God in an intimate way. Let me try to explain that by asking you this. What are some of the best conversations that you've ever had with another person in your entire life that you can reflect back on and think of a conversation where you just connected with another person on the deepest level possible? If you can think of a conversation that you had like that, I'm betting that it was when your spirit, your soul, made a connection with the spirit or soul of another person there had to be a lot of openness there on both parties' part. There had to be some honesty in that conversation, if it was really a good conversation. There were probably deep feelings shared in that conversation. You had to lower the barriers down in order to have that kind of a conversation. Uh, you had to be vulnerable to have that kind of a conversation, right or wrong. But if those things are all true, we can, we can understand those things when we're relating in a very humble, open, vulnerable way with another person. But can you see that that's really what worship is when we come before God in that same frame of mind? In John 4, verse 23, to a woman whose life was totally out of sync with God, Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, John 4, 23, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, there are those moments when my spirit, my soul, the inner being, me, on my inside, lines myself up with God, with God's spirit. And for a moment, there's true conversation, there's true communication, there's true intimacy between us. Mary once sang these words, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Um, in the Psalms, the psalmist said, unto you, O Lord, do I what? Lift up my soul. See, when I lift up my soul to the Spirit of God, when the true spiritual insides of me come face to face with the Spirit of the Creator, that's worship. And I know we do things over and over again. We have our rites, our I-T-E. We have our rituals. We have our repetition. We come every Lord's Day to the same place. Uh, we do the same kind of singing and the same kind of praying and the same kind of Lord's Supper and the same kind of giving. And we repeat all those things. Sing, pray, Lord's Supper, give over and over and over. Sometimes when we come here, we simply observe it's sort of like we're spectators. We watch everything that happens, and we observe all of that. Observation is not worship. Sometimes we come, and we simply listen. We listen to other people. We think it sounds pretty, but just listening is not worship. Sometimes, if we're quite honest with ourselves, and I'm looking back at some of y'all, and I know that you simply endure. You say, when's that old man going to shut up so I can go eat, you know? We simply endure. We're like when I was a little kid, we say, Mom, when's he going to be done? When's he going to be quiet? When can we leave? You know, we endure. That's not worship. Sometimes we mouth words. Like we sing songs like we did before. We might mouth, here I am to worship. But are you, I'm talking about you, are you here to worship? Sometimes we actually participate. Our soul joins in. And spirit to spirit, we become open, we become honest, we become vulnerable, we become people who worship God. Worship is a human being connecting with God on a personal level so that God is pleased and a relationship with God is strengthened. That's what worship is. What is worship? Well, if you're filling in your little blanks, true worship is bringing a gift to God. What have you brought to God today? You know, I'm a poor gift giver. I realize that. 
But you know, when you really give a gift to somebody, and I think Keith said this well a moment ago, you're giving that gift to please somebody, to make somebody happy. You're giving that gift to say something to somebody. You know, what are you trying to say as you give this gift? You're giving that gift, whatever it is, to convey your feelings about another person. Now, I know sometimes it's, oh, you know, little Johnny's got a birthday party, and have we got him a gift yet? And yeah, we got to get him a gift, and, and we get him a gift, and you're smiling because we know that's the way it is, and we give it, but we're not really thinking very much about expressing our deep feeling to little Johnny. Maybe some of you are, but a lot of people, they're just getting a gift. Or maybe somebody has a shower, and we say, oh, you know, we got to get a shower gift, and you go get a shower gift, and maybe we're not really expressing a deep feeling. Maybe sometimes you are if that couple is very personable to you. You know, when Jacob gave Joseph the coat of many colors, and all the other boys were jealous, and the dad gave that son to them a very special gift, his dad was saying something to him. His dad was saying, you're special. His dad was saying, I love you. His dad was was saying, you're the apple of my eye. That's what he was saying. He was saying that with that gift. In uh, John chapter 12, Mary, the, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, she goes in before Jesus and she breaks this alabaster jar of myrrh, nard ointment that was very expensive. In fact, it was worth almost a year's wages. And she breaks this thing and she pours it on his feet and the house is filled with the perfume. And Judas, who was a thief, almost had a heart attack. And he said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? This thing could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And you've just wasted, you've poured it all on his feet or half of it. It's terrible. But what was Mary Magdalene saying? in her heart, from her heart, about how she felt about Jesus. When she poured that on his feet, she was saying something deep. She was saying something powerful. She was saying something personal when she did that about Jesus. Abel in Hebrews 11:4. by faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. And the Bible says, God bearing witness in respect of his gifts. What was he saying? What was Abel saying? He was saying, I respect you, creator. He was saying, I submit myself to you, mighty God. He was saying, I'm thankful to you, Lord. He was saying something with those gifts that he brought. And Noah, when he came out of the ark in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, and he took of those clean animals and he offered, and the Bible says the Hebrew word olah means he sent up in smoke a gift to God, and it says that God smelled the aroma. Nasty burning flesh. Oh, yum. No, God smelled the aroma of those gifts. And what was, what was Noah giving that smelled so good to God? I think God smelled true gratitude going up in that smoke. I think God smelled true obedience and submission going up in that smoke. I think uh, Noah was sending up true commitment to the God who had saved him in that smoke and true humility before the Lord and God said that smells good there was a connection there it was a gift given there was praise offered there was gratitude offered there was a penitent heart offered there was a humble spirit offered there was an offering of love giving money should be an offering of love now you know you get into somebody's pocketbook you're getting personal right If you really get into somebody's pocketbook, you're getting really personal. When we give, I know we kind of gloss over it as a matter of worship, but when we really give to God, we're giving a gift to our Creator, and we're saying something, church, to Him. We're saying something in that gift. I love you. We're saying you mean everything to me. We're saying you're important to me. We're saying your will and your work is way up there. It's the top of my list. We're saying that from our hearts, from our spirit to God. And when we give saying something like that, God can read it. And it's our soul being lifted up to God. And God is saying, ah, that smells good. Unto you, O Lord. 
do I lift up my soul? What are you lifting up to God today? Unto thee, O Lord, and do I lift up my soul? Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul? Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Oh, let me not be ashamed, but not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait. But not my enemies triumph over me. <clears throat> and when I made this lesson, I had a picture of a little boy that's now been replaced by that wonderful stick man right there. And uh, this little boy had a really needy. Uh, worried expression on his face, and he had his little telephone, and he was trying to call his mother. This little boy really wanted to call his mother. Uh, from reading my scriptures in the Old Testament to the New, I've realized that worship is a true calling out of our soul to the Lord. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, after the whole Cain and Abel thing when Cain killed Abel and then Cain was banished and then it says they had another son and his name was Seth and it says then men became, uh, came to call upon the name of the Lord. They began to call upon the name of the Lord. They began to cry out to God. They began to seek God. Remember when you were little and you said, Mom, Mom, da hey, Dad, Dad. And you cried out to your parents, and you needed your parents <clears throat> to answer you, <clears throat> and you needed to hear them and connect with them, and you needed to be received by them. In Genesis 12, 8, the Bible says that Abraham went to this place between Bethel and Ahai, and he built an altar there, and it says there he called upon the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Folks... I know that the Bible teaches that our life is a sacrifice to God. I get that. But will you please listen? Throughout Scripture, theologically, from the Old Testament to the New, what we mean by worship is a specific thing that takes place at a specific th time and a specific place. Notice Genesis 12, verse 8. There, in that spot, he built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. In Genesis 21, verse 33, in Beersheba, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. A little bit later in Genesis 26, 25, Isaac, his son, came to Beersheba and built an altar, and it says there, in that place, at that moment, at that time, he called upon the name of the everlasting God. Just like the little boy went to the office and he was upset, and he got the phone, and at that moment, at time, at that place, he picked up that phone and he dialed that, and there, in that moment, he reached out and called to his mother. Worship is when in a particular place, at a particular moment, we decide that we, from our soul to God's, are going to call out to our maker, and we're going to try to get to our maker and get his attention in a good way. Paul wrote to young Timothy, flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, purity, along with all those that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. When that little boy was calling his mother, he was calling to her from his heart. And when we call on the name of the Lord, we need to call on the Lord out of a pure heart, out of a sincere heart. We sing this song, create in me a clean heart, O God. But this morning, if you've been calling 
to God sincerely, openly, honestly, without reservation, without hiding. You're calling on him out of a pure heart. The psalmist talks about kingdoms who do not call upon the name of the Lord. And there are many people here in our city and in our country who do not call upon the name of the Lord. In Psalm 18, verse 6, the Bible says, In my distress I called upon you, Lord. And I cried to God for help, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came to his ears. Sometimes I call out to God in desperation, and I want my cry to come to his ears. Now, when someone calls here, or when someone calls you at your business, I have an idea that uh, it depends on who calls at some times. And if certain people call, uh, you'll tell your secretary or whatever, and eh, not now. I don't want to talk to that person. Please, I don't want to talk to them right now. Or maybe if there's a certain person who's irritated you over stuff forever and you don't want to talk to them, you'll say, you know, don't take calls from that person anymore. I know that doesn't happen with any of y'all, but I'm pretty sure it does. Don't take calls from that person anymore. And then there are some people that call, especially my sweetheart, if she calls, I say, It doesn't matter what I'm doing or who I'm with or what's going on. If she calls, you interrupt me, and I will talk to her, see? Now, that's the kind of person I want to be with God. I don't want to be when I call out to my father with tears. I don't want him to say, well, I'm not taking calls from him. I want him to say, no matter what I'm doing, interrupt me, because I want to hear from him when he calls, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. My one request, my righteousness, oh God, how I need thee. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cries. Listen. But the face of the Lord is turned against those who do evil. Be gracious unto me, O Lord, for to you I call out all day long. Those who call upon the name of the Lord in worship, those who come to a place like this, those who fall down at their bedside and call upon the name of the Lord out of a pure heart, those who uh, in the morning in the car turn off the radio and cry out to God from a pure heart, those who come to a place like this and instead of just just halfway uh, listening to the person that's leading the prayer, when the heads are bowed, you cry out to your God. Those are the people who are worshiping. They're calling on the name of the Lord. You know, the call of a spirit. I'm not talking about the call of a voice. Listen to me. I'm talking about when the spirit of a person, when the guts of a person, when the soul of a person cries out to the spirit of God. That's worship. From the depths of my soul, I cry out. Let's stand as we sing this together. From the depths of my soul I cry out, from the depths of my soul I cry out, Lord can you hear me, have mercy on me, from the depths of my soul I cry out, in the midst of the sea I cry out. In the midst of the sea I cry out, save me the water is over my head. <clears throat> In the midst of the sea I cry In the midst. out, there is a time to mourn, there is a time to weep, there Sorrow and deep calls to deep. In my moments of grief, I cry out. In my moments of grief, I cry out. Have you forgotten me? Where are you, Lord? 
In my moments of grief, I cry out. There is a time to mourn. There is a time to weep. There is a time for sorrow and deep cause to deep. There is a time. There is a time. There is a time. A time for sorrow and deep cause to deep. From the depths of my soul I cry out. From the depths of my soul I cry out. Still I will pray. Still I will praise you, Lord. Be seated, please. <clears throat> As I've read my Bible over the years, I've discovered that worship, true worship, is a journey. <clears throat> Worship is a journey of my spirit to meet with the Spirit of God. Where are you today? Where have you been today? Where are you going today? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I come to the garden alone. <clears throat> Do you? <clears throat> I can picture Jesus, you know, thinking, <clears throat> pardon me, that he needed to go pray. I can picture him going out, <clears throat> pardon me, the sheep gate of Jerusalem and going down through the Kidron Valley and going up to that garden and longing to be in that garden because he just wanted to be by himself with the Lord. I come to the garden alone. <clears throat> The journey to come and meet with God is a journey from being a taker to being a giver. It is a spiritual journey from being in rebellion to being in humble submission. It is a spiritual journey from the land of denial to the land of openness and honesty. It is a spiritual journey from ignoring your creator to seeking your creator. It is a spiritual journey between being close to God and being open to God. In Psalm 84, the psalmist is talking about a journey, an actual journey of somebody who wanted to go meet God. Psalm 84, verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. See, that's what worship is. It's a pilgrimage to wherever you are in the world and in all your thoughts and in all your craziness and in, in all your worldly pursuits, a pilgrimage. It's leaving that place and passing through whatever valleys you've got to pass through to get to God. They pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They, these pilgrims, go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. Church, church, like we're doing this morning, is not worship. That is, being here is not worship. Let me say it a different way. The assembly is not worship. It's not worship unless you, you personally, make the journey spiritually from wherever you were and wherever you have been to come into the gates of God and come before your God in Zion. You know, we sing this song, and it's a beautiful song. The Lord is in his holy temple. Well, he is, and he always has been. But you have to go meet him there. You have to bring your spirit before his spirit in Psalm 43, this captive that was captive in Babylon said, Let them bring me to your holy mountain, 
the place where you dwell, then I will go to the altar of God. Worship does not equal the assembly. Worship is when you, in your heart and your mind, resolve that no matter what else happens in the gathering of people, you yourself will come before the Lord God and you yourself will bow down to him and you yourself will enter his presence and seek him with a humble and open heart. We sing this old song. It's so beautiful. But I want you to feel the words of it right now. Lord, we come before you now. Lord, we come before thee now, at thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our soon disdain, shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall As you read the Bible from, from Cain to the book of Revelation and Abel to the book of Revelation, worship is obedience, it's humility, it's submission to God. Oh, but God, I want to argue with you a little bit. Surely you don't mean that. Oh, oh Lord, uh, I, I, wanna, I, I can't go that far. Uh, oh, Lord, you know... And we justify what we're doing. And, oh, Lord, I, I don't want to be honest with this. See, true worship always everywhere in the Bible is obedience. Cain was proud. True worship does not occur through pride. A, pride spirit, a prideful spirit is not aligned with God. It's only a humble spirit that connects with the spirit of God. When Cain brought his sacrifice, insisting on doing whatever he wanted to do instead of what God wanted him to do, God confronted him and said, Cain, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? <clears throat> but if you do not do what is right, Cain's sin is crouching at your door, and you must rule over it, Genesis 4, verse 7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Stop arguing with God. Stop rationalizing with God. Stop kicking against God. Do what is right. Submit to God. You say, but I want, it doesn't make any difference what you want. True worship always has been the man, the woman, submitting to the will of God. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Grant me a willing spirit. Yes, that's true worship. Not my will, but yours be done. That's true worship. Whatever you say, Lord, we'll do it your way. Do God's things, but do them with your soul. 
Don't do them hypocritically. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 3 through 4, God spoke through his prophet Jeremiah to the people of Israel and says, you go out every week and, and you live however you want to and you do whatever you want to and you do all these sins and then you come into my house and you just say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, as if all that can be okay. But an obedient heart is obedient all week. The obedient heart is striving to do the Lord's will all week. An obedient heart comes to God and conforms his will or her will to God. We sing a song, and I know it can be looked at it from a different perspective, but it's always bothered me in this regard. <clears throat> I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. But hold on just a second, Brother Dan. Jesus. Hey, Jesus, come on over here where I am. Come on, Jesus, come on over here where I am and walk with me. Jesus, I'd like to go this way. Come on over here with me, Jesus, and walk with me. No, church. No. Jesus is walking down that path of light. He's not going to come over there and walk with me. I've got to go walk with him. He's always been going like this. Come here, take my hand and walk with me. Come here and grab onto me and follow me. I'm the light of the world, he said. He that follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. True worship is saying, Lord, I'll come to you. I'll take your hand. I'll do what you want me to do humble yourself in the sight of the Lord humble yourself in the sight of the Lord humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And He died for us. And He died for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, that saved a wretch like me. So humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he will lift you up. You know that, that Jed is a great worship leader. He really is. Um, he does make me mad sometimes, though. And I had this picture of a mean old angry man on this slide. And he said, you're not putting that. You're not putting that up there. And, and I, the reason I did it, and I probably shouldn't have had the picture, but here's the reason I did it. I wanted us to think for just a second about God's wrath, about God's anger. Now, I know that God is love, and God is wonderful, and God loves us unending. I get that, but you don't see many times that the Bible teaches that there's a very wrathful side to our God. And I think we take that for granted, and there's a type of our worship that we really can't understand unless we understand the wrath of God. <clears throat> In Romans 3.25, <clears throat> excuse me, Romans 3.25, the Bible says God set forth Jesus 
on the cross to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Propitiation. What in the world does that mean? That means to appease, an appeasement. What are we trying to appease? We're trying to appease the anger and the wrath of God. I know we don't like to read it, but Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 2 verse 4. After your hardness, or verse 5, after your hardness and impenitent heart, you are storing up for yourselves wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds the wrath of God. Why would our God be angry? Surely he would never be angry at me. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. Surely God could not be angry with me, but I have offended God. I have hurt God. I have offended his holiness and his nature. I have sinned against him. Doesn't God say all have sinned? And fall short of the glory of God. Micah 6, God asks a question. The prophet asks a question, with what shall I come before the Lord? I mean, how am I going to come to God and how can I possibly appease his anger for all the stuff I've done? And I've done some stuff and you've done some stuff. And God's been angry about it. The Hindus, they don't believe in a God that has love. They don't believe in gods that want to redeem men. They don't believe in gods that care about men. They believe in a bunch of angry, mean, hateful gods. And this is a picture of uh, a group of people beside the Ganges River. And they are bringing bowl after bowl after bowl full of vegetables and fruits and meats and flowers. And they're laying those things down in front of their idols day after day thinking, surely if I do these things, I can, I can make the gods not hate me but be nice to me or feel good toward me nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not of good that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus there is a part of our worship which one of these days soon Dustin and I are going to preach on together it's our blood worship it is our atonement worship and I want you to appreciate what it really is. <clears throat> Imagine yourself in the Old Testament. You're bringing a beautiful lamb that you have uh, uh, nurtured. It's spotless. It's beautiful. Like little Cass one of Cassidy's little goats, you know, it's just perfect. And you're bringing that lamb. And if you have in your mind, which you may not, but I, I do because I remember the steps of the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm bringing that lamb and I'm holding that lamb in my arms and I'm walking up those steps and I know that I have sinned and I have offended God and the, the life of this lamb is going to be what enables me to come before God in his anger to be appeased. Imagine yourself at the Lord's Supper because you see the only thing that will appease the Lord is the lamb of God. Imagine yourself coming before the Lord and I want you to think of Jesus Think of, close your eyes and think of Jesus for a minute and think of him hanging there on the cross and John and his mother at the foot of the cross and they're weeping because of what's happening to him and he's pale and he's thin and he's bloody and he's beaten and he's exhausted and he's weak and they poke his side with that spear and out gushes the blood and the fluid and they realize he's dead and then they proclaim him dead and they begin to take the bodies down off of the cross I'm standing there at the foot of the cross and like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus I'm going to come get the body of Jesus so the body comes down from the cross the soldiers hand him down and I take his pale skinny dead bloody body in my arms 
And I go from there, and I start walking toward the temple of God. And I start up the steps of the temple, going up to the temple of God with the body of Christ in my arms. And I say to God, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And I quote Hebrews 10, verse 10. We are sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And I lay down the body of my Jesus Christ in front of the altar of the Lord. And I say, God, this is my sacrifice to you. And I know because of this that you will accept me and you will cleanse my soul. And I thank you so much, God, for giving this sacrifice for me. Now, that's what I do or a semblance of it at the Lord's Supper. This is my sacrifice. Jesus is my sacrifice. Praise Jesus for what he's done for us. There's blood worship in our worship every Sunday. We come, if we choose to, during that time, before the throne of God with the body of Christ, and we offer it to him again, and we say, Here, God, this is what I bring to you to accept me if his sacrifice is ours. Powerful song. Don't like the title because it's in Latin and nobody understands it. On use day, the Lamb of God. As we offer him to God as our sacrifice today as worshipers, if you don't have the Lamb of God as your sacrifice, you need him. Maybe you need to obey the gospel. Be wonderful if you'd come today. But let's stand and praise him with all of our beings. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Brother Jeff. Seated, please.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're our visitor, you're our honored guest today. We spring forward together. Ready or not, it's coming. So you might as well be ready. I hope you are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed this morning after losing an hour of sleep last night. We are a family. We are the body of Christ together. And thank you, Dan, for reminding us what true worship is all about this morning. We hope you can stay with us for Bible class immediately following services this morning. And we pray especially for the Eisenbergs and the Taylors in their loss last week. Please join us now as we close our time of worship together. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for blessing us today, Lord. Thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice and, and his blood on the cross that saves us, Lord. Uh, forgive us for not being worthy of that sacrifice, Lord. Lord, we pray that uh, you be with Mani in India, that you bless his mission, Lord, and watch over him, protect him. Lord, we uh, pray that you be with all the missionaries around the world and protect them and help them shine the light of Jesus to others. Be with our soldiers overseas, Lord. Bless them. Watch over them. Be with uh, the enemies as well, Lord. Help them to possibly uh, come to you, Lord. Thank you for the love of Jesus. Watch over us this coming week. It's through him we pray. Amen. 